Okay, so thanks everyone for showing up. Um, so the purpose of this series of uh, lectures, three lectures in principle, um, is just to, uh, well, try to get to uh, what we've done recently with the auto von on the three value problem. Um, it's going to be a very biased sort of uh, introduction to the, to the problem, which is very old and the history is very rich and so on. Um, mostly towards, um, I'm, I'm going to be mostly interested in the contact and symplectic techniques that show up, in, especially the use of polymorphic curves and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so the first lecture, I mean, I already sort of wrote down here the, the rough sketch. So the first lecture is going to be introductory and mostly uh, historical in some sense. Um, and try to uh, introduce a problem and try, try to introduce the uh, basic uh, um, notions that have come up throughout the history of the problem and so on. Um, the second lecture is going to be more on the contact and symplectic geometrical side and aspects of it. Uh, well, I'm going to introduce the basics. I'm not, not, not going to assume that anyone knows uh, what a symplectic manifold is at all. Yeah. I'm sorry. I think you have a chat. I have a chat. You can sit down below, it's fine. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to put the chat here. Um, okay, so yeah, as I was saying, so the second lecture is going to be uh, on the geometric and contact aspects. Uh, I'm trying to cover a bit of uh, the work by Wolfer and Mizaki and Zinder on, um, on um, well, trying to form the curve with a view towards a three body problem. And um, if I have enough time on the third lecture, I'll cover uh, what we've done with Otto. So there is a series of uh, lecture notes that I've already wrote uh, and I sort of pass around to some people. And the hope is that I'm going to upload them to the archives soon. Um, and so every comment that people might have is very welcome. So I'm sure they're full of mistakes of all sorts. Anyway, so having said that, let me just. Uh, start with the problem in question. So, so I'll talk a bit about the restricted three-body problem. So this is a very, very well-known problem that people have been working on for a very long time. So the setup is, we start with three bodies. So E, which is the Earth. M, which I'll call the moon, and S, which is the satellite or spacecraft, whatever you prefer, which is supposed to be very small in comparison to the other two. Okay? So they have certain masses, M sub E, M sub M, and M sub S. And well, we have several cases, uh, several simplifications of the problem, which in general is actually quite difficult, uh, which allowed, allow us to say something about the problem. So these are very classical cases, which people have looked at. Can you see correctly? Yeah. Okay, so first of all, we have the restricted case. Is the case where well the mass of the satellite is zero because well basically it's negligible when I compare it to the other two. Um, what this means in practice that the the equations simplify right so this one term which is not there anymore. So this, this means that S is negligible. Then we have the circular case. by which we assume that the Earth and the Moon move in circles. Um, and well, around this, the common center. As opposed to the more general case in which they actually move in ellipses around the center of the answer. Um, then we have the planar case. 
by which we assume that the satellite moves in the plane R2, which is the span of the Earth and the Moon. And then we have, finally, we have the spatial case by which we drop the planar assumption. So now here S is allowed to move in R2. So what's the goal of this problem is, well, to understand the motion of the satellite under the influence of the Earth and the Moon, under their gravitational pull. So just some bit of terminology, E and M are called the primaries. And I'll, usually, because I don't want to write down every time restricted, circular, planar, spatial, whatever, whatever, I will just say a circular restricted free body problem or I'll add some S or a P uh, to mention the cases for which I'm talking about the spatial case or the planar situation. So, as I said, the goal is to study the motion of S. So this is the physical problem. Just draw a picture so we can have the, uh, the Earth and the Moon that are just rotating on the, on the plane that they actually span. Here's to some coordinates. So this is the center of mass of the Earth and the Moon. And well, initially, I'm assuming that they move in circles. Uh, around the center of mass. So this is. And well, what's going to happen is that the planar case is when my satellite starts on the plane with a velocity which is pointing towards the plane. And it, well, it's going to be an invariant subset of the whole dynamical system that we're going to get. So this is why, um, well, it's a particular case uh, that people have looked at. And one of the reasons why people have looked at the planar situation is because of a matter of degrees of freedom. Because the dimensions of the problem is, well, it's, it's much less, well, two less than the spatial. In this problem, there are basically two parameters. Which we'll denote by mu and c. So mu is the mass ratio of the primaries, and c is the energy of the system. So the mass ratio is basically defined by uh, the ratio of the mass of the moon divided by the sum of the mass of the moon and the mass of the earth. So this is some uh, number uh, in the interval zero one. And usually we normalize such that the sum of the masses is precisely one. So one usually takes mu as a mass parameter, which is the mass of the moon. So in other words, mu equals zero corresponds to the case where there is no moon, and uh, mu equals one well corresponds to the case where there is no earth, but like it's a bit psychologically not, uh, not good. So usually one swaps the roles around. Jacobi energy is uh, this parameter C. Well, this is, a, this is going to be a Hamiltonian system. So there's going to be an energy or a, associated to the, to the problem. I'm sorry, I'm a bit confused. Why is between zero and one? Well, because the mass of the moon is less or equal than the sum the mass of the moon plus the mass of the Earth. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Okay. Any more questions? Okay. So 
what is the energy so well we have what's called a Hamiltonian function or energy function of the system which which comes well from physics which in principle depends on time so there's a time parameter t and it's defined on the complement of the positions of the Earth and the Moon, which also, in principle, depend on T, taking values in the numbers. Oh, sorry, I am times R three, taking values in the real numbers. And here we take coordinates Q and P, get a map to H T of Q P. So Q is the position. satellite and P is the momentum of the satellite or, or the velocity if you want to think about a velocity um, and well it has an expression you can write it down well you need to put in the kinetic terms so of the kinetic energy this is just uh, one half the norm squared of P and then you need to put a uh, Coulomb potential for each one of the primaries. So, so mu is the mass of the moon. So I need to divide by Q minus the distance uh, from Q to the position of the moon. And then I need to do the same thing for the Earth. So the mass of the Earth is going to be one minus mu. So I get a term which looks like this. Okay. So this is, well, basically in principle on the nose, what the Hamiltonian uh, what the energy function of, the, of this uh, sort of physical system should be. Okay, so but, but what I don't like about this Hamiltonian is that, well, it depends on time. And here's where one of the assumptions that I made on the problem comes in to simplify our lives, which, which is a circular assumption. So, well, I can do a change of coordinates in which it becomes time independent. So here, I didn't say it, but like mt, is uh, the position of the moon, which I'm, well, let's, let's write first, position of the earth, which is, can be parameterized by, well, it's just a circle of radius mu on the plane. It's rotating on the plane, and then the moon is the same thing, but, uh, well, the, the mass parameter is, uh, what is it, minus one minus mu cosine t, uh, minus one minus mu sine t I'm running out of space so there's a zero here so in principle they depend on time but uh, because of my circular assumption I can just undo the rotation of the primaries uh, by a transformation which depends on time and now I can fix their positions I just rotate them around And the magic is that the Hamiltonian becomes time independent. Yeah. So you said when uniform zero is it's when there is no moon. Yeah. Okay, so um, so when there is no moon, so the Earth seems to not move. When there is no moon, the Earth is sitting on the origin. Yes. There's, I mean, the center of mass is just. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Hey, it's a moving bit. Yeah. Okay, uh, so now, uh, well, I can change my coordinates to a rotating frame. I mean, this is uh, equations in an inertial frame. But now I just rotate my frame, and what happens is uh, the position of the Earth is fixed at mu zero zero. The position of the Moon is fixed at uh, minus one minus mu zero zero. And the Hamiltonian, when I pull back under this transformation, which depends on time, just becomes the same expression, only that now 
M and E are fixed, and I pay the price of an extra term, which is keeping track of this sort of rotated frame. So in other words, it's just one half norm of P squared minus mu norm of P minus M minus M minus mu, the norm of Q minus E. And then I gain an extra term for the, the angular momentum term. You can write down as P1, Q2 minus uh, P2, Q1. So, which I will call L from now on. So this is, if you look at it, it is an angular momentum term. This corresponds precisely to the, an angular component, which is in some sense is planar. So it doesn't have any, any three uh, subscripts. Um, and uh, basically it just corresponds to the, to the Coriolis force and the centrifugal force when you've uh, changed your frame. Okay, the main point here that I'm trying to make is that this is, uh, so this is autonomous. Okay, so there's no T in my expression. So why is this good? Because, well, there's a very general principle in physics that tells you that if you have a Hamiltonian or if you have an energy which does not depend on time, then it's a constant of the motion. So in other words, if I start with some initial configuration of position velocity, then I compute what the energy is, then if I look at the dynamical system that I have, H will stay constant under the, uh, under the dynamics. So let me just write down what I just said. So H, because of the principle of conservation of energy, so H is a conserved constant. Also called an integral or slash integral of the motion. And I have to solve, if, I give, if you give me a Hamiltonian, you know, what I do in physics, first thing I do is write down the Hamilton equations and I solve them, which are the following. So uh, if we solve uh, the equations Q dot equals the derivative of H with respect to P and the uh, P dot, which is the derivative of minus the derivative of H with respect to Q. So I solve this two equations, so this is called the Hamilton equation. And I get some solution of x t q t p of t, which solves this, uh, which always exists. Uh, well, then h of x of t is constant. It doesn't depend on t. Or in other words, the level set uh, h minus one of c is invariant. The flow is invariant under the Hamiltonian flow. For every C. Okay, so this is what, uh, what the very general principle of conservation of energy devices in this situation. Okay, so see here, you know, if I fix my energy, See, this is called the Jacobi constant. So this is the second parameter in the problem. Those are two, mu and c. Okay. So the game here is, uh, well, to try to understand what's going on when I change mu or when I change c or both. Okay. And here, 
we play a problem. It's just by definition when I drop two of the coordinates. So Q3 equals P3 equals zero. This is what the planar problem is. So well, we can look at the equations if you want. You can look at the Hamiltonian. This is clearly an invariant subset for the dynamics. So it's invariant under the Hamiltonian law. Here, with the equations written down, you can do some quick uh, sort of uh, computation of what is the dimension of the problem, right? So, in principle, we're trying to study the motion of, of satellite, which has uh, three dimensions for position plus three dimensions for velocity. So that's initially a six-dimensional problem. When I fix the energy, I lose one, so we get a five-dimensional problem. In the planar case, uh, well, I drop two of the coordinates, so it's a three-dimensional problem. So this is where the degrees of freedom come in. So in principle, what one expects that a three-dimensional dynamical system is much more uh, approachable than a five-dimensional dynamical system. And in some sense, that explains why people have been looking at the planar problem for so long. Poincaré included. Uh, yes. Again, let me just draw the same picture, but like now Earth and Moon are both fixed, and the satellite is doing whatever it's doing. And so here's S, and then well, it's pulled by the Earth and the Moon, so it's going to want to come down to the plane, and then well, it does stuff. I don't know what it does. Yeah, I'm interested to know what was it actually doing. Okay, so let me talk a bit about hill stability. So what is uh, hill stability? Hill by, by this person, uh, we'll call Hill, who studied the problem even before, uh, at the same, around the same time as, as Poincaré was doing. Um, and this notion of that, you know, in some sense, this problem can be stabilized or like if you start sufficiently close one of the parameters you stay there forever it was of interest at the time and actually was quite impressive for Poincaré himself. So if you do the computations you'll find that there are precisely five critical points for the Hamiltonian L1 up to L5 which are called the Lagrangians, Lagrangian critical points. And I ordered them in such a way that the critical values are uh, non-decreasing. Okay. Well, in fact, the critical points L1 up to L5 depend on mu in principle. And actually, well, you can, you can draw a picture of roughly how they look like, the, the critical values. Here's a picture of what the critical energy values look like as I change mu. So here's the mu axis and here's the energy axis C. And well, there's a special value, which is in this convention is minus three halves. Sometimes in different conventions is three halves. Um, but anyway, so. And there's a, there's a curve, which looks something like this. Which is the smallest critical uh, smallest critical value L just L one as a function of mu, and then H of L two is something that looks like this. 
and there's some symmetry in the picture, so this picture is symmetric. Something like this. So H of L2 is this. This is H of L3. And sometimes the convention is that if I move like this, L2 and L1, uh, L3 change roles. Uh, and H of L4 is the same as H of L5. And so this is what the energy values look like. I mean, what's happening is that you should think uh, in terms of Morse theory here. Um, so what's happening is the following. So I can consider the projection pi to position space. which uh, projects QP to Q. Okay, so I just project down onto the positions and I can consider what is called the Hill region for energy C. So K of C, which is uh, pi of the level set corresponding to C. So this is some subset inside R3 minus ENM. And this is called the Hill region. Of energy C. And just to have in mind what's going on, so here's what the hills region looks like if the energy is, well, subcritical. If the energy is below the first critical energy value, H of L1, so, well, here's the Earth and here's the moon, say. And, well, it turns out that there's a component of the hill region which is bounded and it's uh, containing the earth, there's an, another similar component containing the moon and there's a, a non-bounded component which sort of goes all the way up to infinity which is where the asteroids live. So in other words, if you're sufficiently far away and you don't have enough energy, you never come near the earth and you never come near the moon. So you're an asteroid, you're doing whatever you're doing, but you stay a bounded region away from E and M. And similarly, in this region, if I start uh, and I don't have enough energy to do anything else, I will stay here forever and similar near the Earth. So this is like what's happening at, at the low energy limit. So I, I, I'm below the first critical energy value. So, so I haven't crossed any critical phenomenon. And actually what's happening is that the projection of L1, which I'll still call L1, maybe it's just little L1, which is called Li, is a projection of big Li. So here's L1, here's L2, and here's L3, and somewhere over here we've got L4, and L5. So what's going on if I sweep, you know, enough energy, uh, more theory tells me that I have to attach handles as I move across level sets. So what I expect to see uh, topologically is some handle attachments and that's precisely what's going on. So if now, I'm slightly above the first uh, critical value. So if C belongs to H of L1, H of L2. So the hill region, now what it looks like is, uh, well, I have the same components, but like they actually glue to a single component, which contain the earth and the moon. And there's still an unbounded component 
where the asteroids live. But in principle, since I moved my energy a bit over the first critical value, there's a transfer region on which the satellite in principle is a, is, has enough energy to move from uh, the Earth to the moon. So if I want to put some, you know, if I want to throw a satellite to the moon, I need enough energy to do that. And I need as much as uh, HFL1. So let me put some names on things. So, uh, uh, well, this is, uh, I mean, I drew the planar uh, situation, right? I mean, you can imagine what the spatial hill regions look like. There's just subsets in R3. And uh, you need to think like the energy hypersurfaces is sitting on, uh, I still have my velocities left. So they look something like this. So they are projecting down over this, maybe I need colors. It looks something like we project over here. There's another bounded component over the moon, and there's an unbounded one, which is uh, unbounded. Okay, so I will call this components uh, sigma C E. Uh, I'll call this component sigma C M. So these are the bounded components of the metal sets projecting uh, over the bounding components of the hill regions over the Earth and the Moon. And then I have a similar phenomenon over here. So I have a bounded component of the energy level set, which I'll call sigma C, E, M. Okay. Which, uh, well, you should think that topologically, all that's going on is I take these two guys and I take their connected sum, which is right down. Why do they have punctures? That's a good question. Um, they have punctures because, uh, well, in principle, the satellite can collide with the Earth and the Moon. So these are non-compact. I will, I will, I will sort of address that. But like, in principle, we could have collisions, right? Um, so, when Q, I will talk this about this a bit later. But like, when Q is lying on on the moon or the Earth, you remember that if you write, if you look at the formula, there's a Coulomb potential, right, which is singular at at collision, and uh, so there, in principle, the dynamical system becomes singular. So, I mean, the velocity is actually exploding. So this is why. They have non compactness. So I'll, I'll get there. Okay, so this is, a, this is roughly the situation. So it's called hill stability precisely because, well, uh, the motion is stable. If I stay here, I can't do anything else than stay here if I don't have enough energy. So the position space is somehow like split into regions of stability. Okay. So this is field stability. Let me also mention sort of what are the what are called the integrable cases. Which integrability has a precise sense, but uh, I mean I'll touch a bit upon that. But uh, I won't define it precisely. But the integrable cases correspond to mu equals zero, which, as I said before, uh, means that there's no moon. And the Hamiltonian, if I put mu equals zero on the equation that I wrote down before. This looks like um, the norm of p squared minus Coulomb potential over the origin, right? The Earth now is lying on over the origin, plus the angular momentum term. L. Now we want to call this H. I mean, people who are familiar with this will instantly recognize that this is called uh, well. This is a Kepler energy. This is the Hamiltonian or the two body problem. So here K is the Kepler energy. Which is also known as the two body problem. Well, the two-body problem, well, was studied by Kepler as well as many other people. So this is, uh, well, before people actually studied 
with the with body problem, which is much more complicated. Um, so the solution, so the, the solutions of this problem are known, well, known in the qualitative sense. They're actually ellipses. The solutions to the Kepler problem, uh, they look like ellipses. And, well, maybe we can draw a picture to try to understand what's going on. So you should think there's a unique primary now which is, here, which is sitting somewhere and then my, my satellite is doing things around it so there's just two body problems uh, where one of the primaries is gone the moon is not there anymore so I have the satellite s well and I'm just we want to do very few things I'm pulled by the earth so it can either just uh, you know if you shoot in this direction uh, it will come close and then sort of will be attracted its motion will be deflected by the pull of the earth and then it'll come back and close up and come back to itself. It was an ellipse. So this is what it's called a direct ellipse because the motion is, uh, let's say, uh, this is counterclockwise. Yes. And I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> so this, is a, this is a direct. Or you could shoot the other way and uh, sort of what's going on, my pictures are not good, which you can imagine so that you have the same phenomena but the opposite direction. But now the motion is not direct anymore, it's sort of clockwise, so this is called the retrograde. And I'm not sure if I'm getting the retrograde uh, direct dichotomy correctly, so it, it's, I have 50% chance of being correct on whether clockwise or anti-clockwise is what it should. Anyways, so, and, but you could also, you know, just shoot directly to the Earth and collide with it. So this is what a collision orbit looks like. It looks like a line. So this is a. So what you think when you, when you sweep and when you start shooting orbits from S, you the behavior changes from direct uh, to, to retrograde, going through a collision. Okay. So and your question is good, and this is because. Well, here you see that uh, that you have non compactness of the dynamic system, right? As you approach the Earth, um, conservation of energy implies that the velocity is growing up to infinity. It's exploding. So, I mean, the levels that cannot be compact near collision. Okay. So, this is, so this is roughly what the solutions to the Kepler problem look like. And here, well, we set one of the parameters of the problem to zero. We didn't exactly get the Kepler problem because we need to remember that we're not working on the uh, inertial system, inertial reference, we are rotating. So this is what L is remembering. So this is usually called the rotating Kepler problem. So this is the Kepler problem in a ro rotating frame. So H is K plus L. This is the rotating Kepler problem. or if you want the Kepler problem in a rotating frame. Um, so you can also imagine what the solutions to this problem look like. Um, it's just, you take a Kepler uh, ellipse and you just rotate it around in the plane. So. So here, actually, well, K and L, they actually commute in a very precise sense. But just need to think that their flows, the Hamiltonian flows, uh, actually commute. So because the Hamiltonian is just a sum of K plus L, you can see that the, well, denote by 
phi th, which is the Hamiltonian flow. I start with the initial position and velocity. I solve the Hamilton's equations. That's my Hamiltonian flow um, associated to h. It's just the composition of the Kepler flow and the uh, Hamiltonian flow of the angular momentum. So Hamiltonian flow of L is just rotating by angle t in the plane. So this is this is rotation. On, on the plane, on, on the span of the Earth and the Moon. So uh, from this sort of uh, hand waving that I just gave, you can sort of uh, imagine well, you can, what, a, what a generic orbit looks like or what, a, what you would expect an orbit of this problem to look like. And it's, well, they tend to look like this. So here's, uh, say, here's the, the primary, the Earth. And here's a boundary of the hill region, which is uh, near the Earth. So everything that starts here stays here forever. Um, and well, what's going on? So an orbit wants to look like something like this. So you approach the Earth, your mo motion gets deflected, and then you do some sort of like, I mean, this is rotating. So you, you do something like petal picture. Uh, something like this. I got something of this way, roughly. And you know, you're basically taking an ellipse of the Kepler problem, you're t rotating it around. So it might or may, might not close up depending on whether uh, the, the period of the ellipse is, is, is a multiple of two pi, which is the period of the rotation. So, so orbits, not necessarily closed. But uh, well, I need to have what's called resonance. So the resonance condition is just uh, that a multiple of 2 pi, an integer multiple of 2 pi, say 2 pi L, has to be the same thing as uh, integer multiple of tau, where here tau is the uh, sort of the period of the ellipse. Of the Kepler ellipse. And well, actually, usually called uh, Kepler's third law that uh, the period of the ellipse only depends on the energy C. So if you fix the energy, every Kepler and his, uh, ellipse has the same period. Um, right, so. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> so you just need to think that orbits look something like flowers and then might or might not close up depending on whether or not have that condition. So in some sense like, um, this I call the integrable cases in some sense because I can have hopes of understanding what the orbits actually look like. Um, I can actually solve the equations in some sense. I can integrate the equations. Uh, so let me, I'm not shocking you. So just, uh, just to be sure I'm not confused, uh, in the case that we're mu equals zero, you don't have to do your change of variable at the beginning to have a time independent. Yeah, yeah. well. It is really the real. Sure, but like, you think, okay, if I forget about the primary, I get the two body problem, the Kepler energy. But what I'm saying is that I want to remember that I changed coordinates. Okay. So I don't get exactly the Kepler problem, I get the rotated version, right? which is a different problem than the Kepler problem. You can sort of see it here. Because in the Kepler problem, everything is periodic. If you fix the energy, the orbits all close up, except well, collisions if you want to. Um, in the Kepler problem, that might not happen. So you can see the, the acid dynamical systems are different. Um, yeah. So yeah, the, the main difference I remember that I changed coordinates before dropping the one of the dropping them. Yeah. But what uh, what does it mean? I mean 
I mean, do you can, do we see these in in real life or? Well, I mean, um, in some sense, the importance of this rotating curve problem is not that you see it too much in life; is that it's, it arises a limit case of the of the free body problem, and this is why you want to study it uh, because then you will want to take sufficiently nearby uh, system like mu not zero but very close, and then if you understand the mu equals zero case, you would have hopes of understanding the mu small case. So this is a perturbative philosophy. In sense. So from here, you know, very, very roughly what in integral means, or you should think that it means without a, a proper definition is uh, uh, it's solvable. And, you know, it's a sort of a philosophical question what solvable means. So solvable, at least from the qualitative, qualitative point of view, I can sort of um, understand what the orbits look like. Um, I mean, if you ask more like quantitative questions, that's much harder. And that's why, you know, integral systems are sort of, uh, still very widely studied. Um, and well, there's also lots of integrals. Uh, words, there's, there's enough, there's enough uh, constants of motion that I can use those to uh, understand uh, the dynamics. Um, and this is pointing towards what the actual definition is. So just you have, uh, you have uh, in, this, in, the, in the case of a spatial problem, you want to have three commuting, uh, photon commuting intervals. And this is what the integrability means. Um, in the planar problem, you would want two. So it's always half the mention of the of the, of the of the phase space. Okay. Anyways, so uh, and you have lots of integrals, and there's also the presence of algebraic geometry in a way. So solutions to this kind of uh, dynamical systems uh, allow descriptions in terms of algebraic geometry. And Whenever you have an integrable system, you have what I'll, what I'll call the arnold urinal coordinates. Or the action angle coordinates. So the phase space, the uh, space of QPs is foliated by invariant tori. Which sort of the, this tori generically there's just half dimensional. So for example, in the planar problem, you have two dimensional tori which are invariant under the, under, under the flow, and the flow is linear on the tori. And uh, well, the slopes of this motion might change from tori to tori, it might change behavior. It might be sort of rational or irrational, even more than irrational, it's called the Ophantine. And basically, historically, what you want to do, you know, what people have tried to do is understand an integrable case. Uh, and then sort of perturb the tori and then sort of study what remains. So this is the natural realm, it's, it's called KKN theory uh, or sort of weaker versions um, like over the matter theory and so on. Okay, so this is sort of, I'm getting into the sort of the perturbative philosophy in some sense. So what you want to do, you want to sort of uh, identify an easy case and then you want to sort of un try to understand nearby cases by perturbing those. Uh, and also another fact that it's uh, interesting in this problem, if I take my energy to go to minus infinity, so it's very, very, very low. So now the Hill's energy, the Hill's energy and the Hill's regions are sort of um, getting smaller and smaller around the primaries. I need to do some regularization procedure, which I now explain a bit. But what you will see after regularizing, what you will see is the Kepler problem. Okay. So, in other words, mu equals zero corresponds to uh, an integrable case, which is a rotating Kepler problem. But uh, if I take very, very, very negative energy, I see the Kepler problem. 
So these are the two sort of integral easy cases in which I can sort of understand the dynamics. So, so mu close to zero or C very, very negative are what, what are usually called the sort of near end, uh, sort of near integral cases. Or perturbative cases. Okay, so in the picture that I drew before, so if you have so this is H of L one in the in the picture that I drew before. So everything below is subcritical, so it's low energy. So if I look at so this is mu mu equals one and mu equals zero. So mu here I have the the subcritical rotating Kepler problem. And as I move down, I see the Kepler problem at the limit. This is the rotating Kepler problem. And here at minus infinity, I have the Kepler problem. And here we've got the low energy. So this is a low energy range. Well, I still have bounded hill regions, uh, bounded components near the earth. And any questions before I move on? People, hands on. I mean, if you have any questions, uh, just uh, feel free to interrupt me. Don't write the, on the chat because I'm probably not going to see it. Okay, so let me just, as I said before, sort of let me recap this perturbative philosophy that's been around for such a long time. So let me as I said, I mean the perturbative philosophy is, I mean, it's sort of everywhere in maps and physics. In some sense, like uh, well, it's understanding understand the easy case. And then sort of try to understand by this understanding, try to understand nearby cases. And here in this sort of, uh, I mean, very, very clear examples of this philosophy is exactly KM theory. The famous uh, theorem by uh, by Kolmogorov, Arnold, and Moser tells you that if if you start with some Liouville torus, which is sufficiently irrational in the sense that sort of the orbits uh, don't, cl I mean, the, the orbits don't close up, but the slopes are not only irrational but very badly approximated by by numbers. Then, um, and if you have some sort of non-degeneracy condition on the action, then you perturb and you still see invariant tori, which are sort of whose Low slopes are close to the original ones. So this is the famous KM the uh, theorem. And there are infinitely many versions of that. Uh, um, and uh, well, you also have some uh, complementary versions of weaker versions, if you want, which is sort of out of matter theory. Over matter theory is more like a measure theory type of approach on which you consider sort of uh, 
the supports of measures which satisfy that, that minimize certain action functionals and they're actually the supports of those measures are actually invariant under the dynamics so in practice what this uh, theory gives you uh, is supposed to approach uh, those tori which are not uh, diophantine in, in the sense needed for km theory they could be resonant so they could all close up or even maybe the perturbation is not necessarily small but very large so over the theory gives you sort of invariant subsets which tend to look like counter sets and maybe they're sort of quite complicated um, so in some sense both theories have been used sort of uh, com in complementary ways um, so you know an invariant subset of uh, matter theory is also one of the km tori but like this gives you more crazy general objects and well if you want also if you're more like physics minded which i guess not many here in the audience you can also consider uh, you know, Feynman diagrams in, in quantum field theory, right? So uh, Feynman diagrams in QFT are precisely, you understand sort of uh, the easy case and then you add some interaction potential and then sort of you expand, uh, you have the perturbative expansion and you need to count sort of, uh, you need to count the weights for over graphs, over the Feynman graphs. And sort of this is also another sort of instance of perturbative philosophy, very sort of different in flavor from this one. Anyways, so in some sense, I'm not doing anything very precise at the moment. I'm just giving some sort of flavor of what's going on. Let me also discuss a bit about collisions, which has come up already a bit. I'm running out of talk here. Okay. So, anyways, so so let me discuss a bit about collisions. So a collision, well, it's just when the position of the satellite is precisely on the moon or on the Earth. So this is, you know, from the perspective of an engineer, this is terrible, right? So you never want your satellite to collide with the primary. So you want to avoid this at all costs. But we are not really engineers, so we don't really care. So we, but like, what we would like to do is uh, we would like to still continue the dynamical system after the catastrophe of a collision, right? So we don't want to, you know, we don't want once the satellite collides, okay, game over, my dynamics stops, I can't play anymore. So we don't want that. We want to sort of continue the game. So how do we continue the game? So uh, well, we add some, uh, what's called, well, a trampoline, if you want to. So every time I collide, I come back in the same direction that I came from, in the, well, or in the opposite direction that I came from. I don't go through, I come back. So this is, this is what I'd like to, and in some sense, that's a natural thing to do from the picture that I drew before on the Kepler problem. You, when you go from retrograde uh, to direct through collision, if you want to have a sort of continuous dynamical system extended even after collision, then the collision orbit better come back over itself. And so you don't want it to go over. Roughly, that's, that's a picture that you should keep in mind for uh, regularization processes when you regularize the dynamical system. So. Let me just sort of bring down to earth uh, what I just said. Um, uh, so here, um, because I'm at collision and I have conservation of energy, remember that there's some Coulomb potentials and they have some minus signs in front of them and so on. If I want the energy to be conserved, then the velocity better explode. So every time, so if a, if a satellite is sort of going to crash against the earth, uh, well, the moment before crashing it has infinite velocity. So one of the recipes in order to regularize collisions is due to Moser. So there are many different ways of doing this. Um, and there's a whole literature on regularizations. But so I will only want to deal with two body uh, collisions in this problem, right? So there are no three body collisions or, or more. So one of the ways to regularize two body collisions is due to Moser. And 
So I do. I will do this near the earth, near the earth, or the moon, or or um, um, both at the same time. So this is supposed to be thought of near M or E. So what does this actually amount to? Um, in fact, it amounts to you take your Q, you take your position, and you take your velocity, and then you swap them for a reason which is slightly mysterious at the moment, but you, you want to swap them because the, you want the, per, the transformation that you will write down to preserve the symplectic form, which I haven't told you what it is, but it doesn't matter. So you swap them, and then you take the stereographic projection. maybe the inverse of the stereographic projection. Um, and so you get new coordinates are called psi eta, and these guys will lie in t star three. In some sense, what I'm doing is I am adding uh, p equals infinity to the north pole in R3. So, so, so I'm compactifying R3 to S3 by adding infinite velocity at the north pole. And because I swapped my coordinates first, uh, this is a bit, uh, this is one of the confusing things about this process is that one should think that the velocity is on the base of T star S3 and the position is on the fiber of T star S3. Okay, so this is, a, this is a trick here for most of regularizing. So the effect is the following. So Let me just mention that, you know, um, I'm choosing things from the lecture notes. The lecture notes are more precise than, than, than the actual lectures. So if you don't understand anything of what I'm saying, you go and read it up. Okay. Okay, anyway, so uh, what the effect of this process of, uh, of regularization is, uh, for you should think that you have S3 but now I want to think of S2 in a kind of a weird way I want to think of S2 not as the equator but as the meridian or one of the you know, this guy yeah. so this is S2 inside S3 um, and here I've got P now velocity moves on the base rather than the fiber. So this is P equals infinity. And this is here P equals zero. So this is where my satellite has no velocity at all. So it stays still. And then I just leave it there and then it's gonna be pulled by the earth or the moon. Okay. And on over P equals infinity, the fiber is well, uh, it's precisely when I'm at collision. So this is called the collision locus. So this is what you should think is happening is that on, on phase space on, on QP, if this is Q P coordinates, I'm taking sort of one of the primaries here. And you know, collision means that I'm precisely at this position, but what I'm doing is I'm adding, uh, like I'm doing a, a, a blow up, like a real blow up. I'm adding all the possible directions in which I can sort of approach my collision which one should think of actual positions. This is a bit weird. So I'm adding all infinitesimal positions on which I can sort of bounce back. So this is, this is the fiber over the collision locus. So I'm basically doing a real blow up. And the Hamiltonian H, which before was singular, right? So it had singularities precisely at collision. Um, I need to, well, after time reparameterization, so one of the bad things about this process is that I'm actually forgetting time. Um, but uh, as I said, I mean, we, we don't really care as to uh, the way that we're going to do things from now on uh, as to how, how long does it take to get to from anywhere. Uh, we just forget about time. 
and sort of after this time reparameterization, sort of H gets uh, regularized to a Hamiltonian Q. Define on the cotangent bundle of S3, which is a regularized Hamiltonian. And so what, what's happening is that before I had some level sets, remember I called sigma CE the boundary component of the level set projecting to the possible to write Q. Q? What do you mean? What do you mean? Is it possible to write Q? Regularize, uh, to write, yeah, to write it. Um, I'll try to imagine what it is, but. Yeah, you can. I mean, okay, so. You need to fix the energy first, right? You fix the energy and you regularize near that level set. And uh, you, you have an expression for Q, which you can write down, sort of Q if you want to know. Q has an expression which looks like this. So Q of psi eta is one half some function F squared times the norm of theta squared. And this function F is very complex. So what you should think of is I put F equals one, I've got the uh, Jodesic flow on S3. And you know, that's actually one of the limit cases when I have infinite, uh, when the energy is minus infinite, minus infinity. Um, and well, in general, this F is a sort of, you can write down the expression. I mean, I don't, forget, don't remember it out of the top of my head. Like, yeah, you can do that. So what, what's happening is that the effect of this whole thing is that after you've done this, uh, this sort of, there's a computation that you need to do and so on. So this uh, level set near the, uh, or lying over the hill region over the earth gets compactified. And topologically, it's just, well, it's a level set of this guy. And this is a level set of Q. So level set of Q, and it's actually, well, it's actually diffeomorphic to the unit cotangent bundle of S3. So this is, so this is my notation for the unit cotangent bundle of S3, those co-vectors whose norm is one, on S3. I mean, it's some level set, it's not precisely the round level set, which would correspond to F equals one. It's some sort of, you know, other thing. And so similarly, the same happens for the component near the moon. So the component near the moon gets compactified. Also, a copy of the unit potential bundle of S3. And remember, the, when, I, when I cross the first critical value, I get sort of this sort of connected sum component, and that is also compactified. So, a connected sum of two copies of unit potential bundle of S3. This is smoothly what's going on. And well, okay, if you want to be a bit more precise, Paolo, so what you need to think here is that, well, the critical point L1 is, uh, is an index one critical point, it's a hyperbolic critical point. Um, and well, I have, that means I have a Weinstein handle, a one, one handle. And what I'm doing is sort of, sort of I'm, I'm extending the, the Hamiltonian in such a way that the level set is precisely the effect of attaching a one handle on two copies of S star S3. This is a sort of more precise version if you want. So um, this is, well, this is, you can also see this as a level set uh, of a Hamiltonian Q defined on the boundary connected sum of two of these guys. Um, 
this natural means the boundary connects sum. So I just take the connect sum only on the boundary. Um, the picture is roughly, so I have my, my two components. And then what I'm doing is uh, sort of, I'm crossing the critical value. So I'm seeing some sort of connected sum picture. So here's D star is three. Here's their boundary connected sum. And Q sort of uh, is a Hamiltonian here, and sort of one of the level sets is precisely this regularized thing. So if, if it, this doesn't make any sense to you, what you should, should think is that I have collisions. That's bad, okay. But I have a process on which I can sort of compactify those collisions by adding a point at infinity. And now I have a compact level set. And having compact level sets is good for many, you know, for, for many reasons, um, which uh, well, we'll see at some point. Uh, and sort of, let me mention that the planar problem is also compactified along. Okay? So the planar problem here sits as a core dimension two invariant subset. And it also has a Moser uh, compactification, Moser regularization, sitting inside uh, this compactified level sets as also for dimension two invariant subset. So the planar problem also gets compactified. Uh, the level sets, which are denoted by and it's also the one near the earth, but it's the planar level set. Uh, this is compactified uh, to a copy of RP3. There's nothing else in the unicotension bundle of S2 when I see it inside the unicotension bundle of S3. So S2 inside S3 has uh, this sort of vertical equator. And similarly, if I put the moon here, and also this. Uh, you just wrote the same thing. What? You just wrote the same thing instead of M. Oh, sorry. And so if I have the, uh, the EM one, which is just a copy of a uh, connected sum of two RP3s. Okay, so in other words, I mean, I'm, I do the same construction, but two dimensions lower. And these guys are uh, invariant under the dyna uh, Hamiltonian dynamics of the regularized Hamiltonian Q inside this compact map. So, you know, it's just smoothly just think, okay, I have an RP3 sitting inside a, a unicode tangent bundle of S3. That's a core dimension two, so manifold invariant under my dynamic system. And similarly for the connected sum. And the reason why I'm looking at sort of a, I mean, all this discussion was for low energy, right? I haven't talked about sort of uh, L3, L4, or L5, so everything was below L1 and sort of in between L1 and L2. And there are reasons for that. And the reasons is, well, we'll see it later, but that's where I can do contact geometry. And let me just mention a few facts about this regularization procedure. fact, the Moser regularization of 
of the Kepler problem at negative energy. Uh, it's precisely the geodesic flow on S2 or S3, well, geodesic flow on S2 if you're looking at the planar problem or well, S3 for the spatial problem. So this is planar. So S, S2 sits inside S3, that's a totally geodesic subset if I take the round metric. Uh, and what I'm saying here is that remember, the Kepler problem and everything is periodic, but now after I've done this sort of regularization and collision, what I will see if my energy is low, I will see the geodesic flow on a sphere where everything is periodic. So the orbits are the great circles, the geodesics for the round metric. So this is a fact that one can check. This is obviously completely periodic as the Kepler problem is. Dynamically, this is not very interesting, uh, at least from a qualitative point of view. Um, and then the rotating Kepler problem, it's a similar thing. This gets regularized under Moser by something of which I'll write down very sort of, uh, uh, this is sort of for energy less than minus three halves, which is the, the, the sort of the, the value of the energy, which is a critical one. Uh, so this gets regularized under Moser to well, a composition of the Jurassic flow on, on S3 with a rotation. And the angle of rotation depends on the, on the energy. So like this is roughly sort of Jurassic flow composed with some, this is, this is very, very imprecise, but like with a rotation. I mean, what's going on is you take a sort of a great circle on the sphere and then you just rotate it around, and this is what it looks like. How much you rotate depends on, on, on the energy and actually depends on the angular momentum as well. Anyways, so in principle, you can sort of easily get your hands on this. Uh, integrable limit cases. Okay. So for, for this? Yeah, so for the rotating rotating capital room, mu equals zero. So this is this is a mu equals zero case. And this is uh, minus infinity as the energy. So these are the integrable cases. So in general, uh, in low energy, if I, after I take the Moser regularization, I get some crazy dynamics. And that's the goal is to understand what's going on. So in principle, if you understood this, you might have some hopes of understanding uh, the cases where mu is uh, slightly positive or where the energy is very, very negative. So this is this is somehow the goal. I don't remember what was this free of. What's what? This value free one of M minus three halves. Yeah, minus three. Uh, uh, remember the picture that I drew where where I just graphed the critical values of the energy. Oh, yeah, yeah, minus yeah. three halves is like precisely oh. where all the curves yeah. meet. I mean, some specific value comes out from a computer. So that's less than L1 or uh, from you? H of L1, uh, so for, for the rotating Kepler problem, that's precisely, uh, yeah, what? Yeah, that's, yeah. Just need to remember the picture that I drew before. Okay, so let me, yeah, okay. I'm gonna say a few things, a few more things, and then we'll take a break in 10 minutes, four, 10 minutes, and then we'll continue.
So let me just give a definition, which is uh, very well known and originally introduced by Poincaré himself. And in some sense, it's uh, widely used by people doing dynamics, which is the notion of a global service of section. So assume that we have some flow Ct on some three manifold n. So let's say this is a autonomous flow. On a three manifold n. On a closed three manifold n. So a global source of section is well, it's a, a surface embedding in the three manifold, but it's also known as a a Birkhoff section. This is a surface. Sitting inside the three manifold, so it's embedded inside uh, the three manifold such that it satisfies uh, a bunch of conditions. So the first one being the S is a union of orbits. Second condition is that ET is transverse to the interior of S. Or in other words, I mean, the vector field that generates the flow, which I'm assuming is time independent, is uh, transverse to the interior of S. And the third condition is that for every point in the manifold, which is not in the boundary of S, uh, there exists uh, some positive time t plus, which depends on t on p, and also it says some negative time t minus of p, uh, such that uh, phi of p plus minus p of p lies in the interior of s. In other words, any point which is not in the boundary of the surface intersects the interior of the surface in the future and in the past. So the picture is, I have my surface inside my three manifold. So this is S. And I'm assuming that I take any point which is not in the boundary, which is a bunch of orbits, then I start, you know, I hit it with the flow and it does whatever it does. And then at some point it hits in the interior. I flow towards the future and also in the past. So this situation gives me what's called the, well, the first return map, the point carrier first return map. So which is just defined by, I take a point here, I look at what it does under the flow, and then I look at the first point of return and I map it to that point. So it's a first return map. So the Poincaré first return map is a map F defined in the interior of S, taking values in the interior of S. is f of p goes to is precisely the tau p time of the flow applied to p where tau p is just the minimal uh, positive time on which the point of which the orbit of the point hits the interior of the surface so 
your tau of p is the minimum t such that pt of p lies in the interior of s. So just take a point, flow it, see where you first hit the interior of the surface, that's your map. Um, and so what's the point of this? So if you, if you have a dynamical system on a three manifold, so that this is a continuous dynamics, uh, but if you're also lucky uh, to have a global surface of section, what you've done is you've reduced the dynamical system to a continuous, to a discrete dynamical system of the diffeomorphism given by the return map. Right, so now the main point of this construction is that periodic points of F as a discrete dynamical system, so I just iterate the map, corresponds in a one one way to close orbits of the of the flow. away from the boundary of s, right? So if I take a point here and, you know, I iterate a million times and then I hit the same point again, I have a very long orbit of phi t. And those uh, orbits have in some sense a natural uh, integer period, right? As the period of the corresponding fixed point. Right? So here, this is just p, such that f to the k of p is p for some k. So this is the, the minimal such k is a period of my periodic point, and this gives me some sort of uh, similar notion of the period here. Integer path. So what you, of course, what you what you see is that the lar the largest the period of the periodic point is the longest time your orbit takes to come back to itself in a very non well-defined way because remember we're not really caring too much about time at this moment okay so i'm gonna take a break for 10 minutes and then we'll continue after that any questions I'm going to grab coffee.
Okay, so I'll, I'll continue. So, I mean, this idea of a, of a lower surface of section, in some sense, it's, uh, it's in many, many different places. And, you know, as I said, the, the, the idea is to reduce uh, three-dimensional dynamics of a continuous flow to a two-dimensional dynamic of a discrete return map. Right? Um, and you can very well say that in some sense, after Poincaré was uh, looking at the planar situation and trying to find global surfaces of section, uh, this is why dynamics on surface has become so important. And it's a huge industry in its own right. People have been studying uh, maps on surfaces for quite a while already. Um, let me just sort of summarize what I think Poincaré's approach to finding orbits uh, is. So Poincaré's approach uh, on the planar problem one can roughly say that it uh, consists of, of two points. The first point is, well, first you need to find a global surface section. And then if you're lucky enough and you were able to do so, then the second point is, well, you might hope to hit, uh, to hit your return map with some fixed point theorem. So this is, let's say, proof a fixed point theorem. For the return map. So what you would get from this, well, is a bunch of orbits, right? So this is the search of orbits in the planar problem, which in some sense from a dynamical point of view is the simplest thing that you can possibly want to do. Um, well, because in some sense they tell you, um, well, they, 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 they're the basic skeleton of the dynamical system. Um, and we symplectic geometers have been sort of taught uh, well, for a number of years now, since the burst of flurry and so on, uh, how to find closed orbits. Like, um, I guess the next step is to, to try to find more interesting uh, things than just closed orbits. Um, but the germ of um, many of the developments of the last century, I would say, in terms of finding uh, orbits and whatnot, uh, can be reduced to this very basic scheme. Um, and the, set of, the setting for this, uh, for this approach is, uh, well, for step two, you should think, well, the poincare Birkhoff theorem. Uh, which I'll, I'll sort of recall uh, in a minute, but, um, Poincaré Birkhoff theorem was also called uh, Poincaré's last geometric theorem. He sort of uh, um, proposed it before he died and proven a bunch of uh, sort of particular cases of them. And then it was taken up by Birkhoff and actually proven in general. So the idea was precisely, well, if you have a global subsection, it's actually an annulus and you have some twist condition, then you will be able to find many orbits. Um, so, In some sense, historically, from the three-body problem, there are two important cases, um, which is where the case, uh, the first case is when the surface is an annulus, and the second case is when the surface, the surface is a disk. And I say historically important because, well, they first appeared in the three-body problem. So two important cases. The first case is A, the case where the surface of section is a, an annulus, which E is a symplectic geometry with the node as D star is one, but other people might denote by 
times one one times this one. This is the angles. Um, and here you can roughly say that this is closely related to the study of twist maps. Twist maps on the angles, which is precisely the setup for Poincare Berkov. And P, well, the case where you have a disk. This is a two disk. And here, of course, this is closely related to the study of homeomorphisms on the two disk. Which is something that you know people have been looking at for quite a while. And there's a lot of of theory for maps on the two disk, and still, you know, still quite a lot of work to be done. Um, so let me sort of let me uh, explain a bit more uh, this uh, step two. What are the fixed point theorems that you could possibly want? So I'm, I'll mention some classical fixed point theorems that have come out of this whole story. Um, but it, it, there are actually many. I'll just mention a few of them. So for step two, so classical fixed point theorems. Well, the first fixed point theorem that everyone should have in their heads is, of course, that one due to Brouwer. The Brouwer fixed point theorem. Well, well I'll also call the translation theorem. I'll, I'll use the Brouwer translation theorem because you know exactly the same. Which is usually uh, sort of a Stated as, a, as homeomorphisms of the plane, but I'll sort of state it as a homeomorphism of the uh, open disk. So, and there are many, many different versions, but this is a version that I want. So, every area preserving homeomorphism of the interior of the disk uh, has a fixed point. So if you have a global surface of section, which is a two disk, well, you have an orbit. Another theorem is, well, the poincare Berkhoff theorem that I just mentioned. Which is, I think it was proved in 1913. Poincaré is sort of stated in 1912 or so, so which says that the homeomorphism of the annulus uh, which is error preserving um, and satisfies a suitable twist condition um, has a periodic orbits of unbounded period. So usually there's a version, which I guess is was the original one, that says, well, it has at least two fixed points. Um, I'm just stating a, a slightly improved version in which I'm stating infinitely many periodic points. So not necessarily fixed points. Yeah, I mean, sort of there's a, there's a, a 
So this is one of the versions of the theorem. Um, and there's also another famous theorem to Franks uh, along the same lines. Which was proven much later, so this is uh, 1992, um, which can be stated as an area preserving homeomorphism um, of the open or closed annulus. that has one periodic point, in fact, has infinitely many of them, and they're all in theory. Has infinitely many. Interior periodic points. Okay, so these are sort of very well known uh, theorems for uh, for the annulus or the two disk. And you, one of the things that, that I want to point out is that usually they're stated for just for homeomorphisms. One of the magic things about Dimension two is that they can be studied. These maps can be studied in great generality. You can say things just for homeomorphs, which is not necessarily true in higher dimensions. Um, and another thing that I want to point out is like, why is the area preserving sort of condition always around? And that has to do with the Liouville's theorem in, in, in sort of Hamiltonian dynamics, which I'll later, when I start talking about symplectic geometry, we'll see a version of it. Um, roughly every time that you have uh, some one of these. Uh, return maps coming from a dam uh, Hamiltonian dynamical system, you will get an area preserving map for a certain volume area form. Um, and of course, there are sort of many different versions of these theorems, and like there are many more, which I'm not saying. So, this is by all means not sort of not, com not a complete story. Um, but one of the, one of the, one of the good uh, combinations of, of the two theorems is what happens when I, com when I sort of uh, Combine Browers with Franks um, and get the following statement, which some people uh, in contact topology might recognize. So, what happens if I do Brower? Plus Franks. But sometimes it's also called Franks theorem, so I'm not really sure. Uh, but well, if I have a map from the interior of the two disk that is area preserving, I get a fixed point right by Brouwer. But now if I remove it, if I remove that fixed point, I have a map from the open annulus. So I remove it. So uh, I get uh, basically uh, a map of the open annulus. So now I can I can use Franks on this. So if it has, it might have none, but if it has one, it has. Uh, what am I saying? Uh, well, so the end the end result before I get confused is uh, that F has uh, one or infinitely many periodic points. Uh, 
And if it happens that the two disk is a global surface of section for a dynamics on a three manifold, if you also count the orbit in the boundary, then you'll have two or infinitely many orbits for the flow. So this is a combination of the two terms. And you know, depending on whether or not you're familiar with the many fixed point theorems along the way, so this is a statement that has appeared in very different guises. Um, some of them we will visit at some point. Okay, so this was step one. Right, step two in the Poincaré approach, but what about step one? Um, if you see historically all the fixed points uh, theorems in some sense came before all the uh, attempts at actually finding the surface of section because in some sense finding global surface of section in the given problem is very hard. Um, so let me state what's known in this direction for the for the three body problem so step one let me state the results for the planar three body problem so through case uh, a which is uh, an annulus So the case where mu is very small, this is point correct. 1912. So you get a global surface of section, which is an annulus with this perturbative situation. And then you can sort of, he also to check the first condition. So Poincaré, I mean, in some sense, okay, you can interpret that he started with the integral system. He found a uh, annulus, which is a global surface of section, which is not so hard to do. And then you perturb that and you get a global surface of section, which is an annulus for this uh, case of the three-body problem. And then this means that there's a lot of orbits if you have Poincaré for a cup. Like it didn't happen. You know. Anyways. So the case where the energy is very, very negative, this was done by Conley in 1963. And he also checked the twist condition. Um, so this are the perturbative situations, right? And then non perturbatively the latest result that I'm aware of is where you see lies in what's called the convexity range. Which is uh, well, some range of parameters in which you have some suitable convexity um, condition, which I'll maybe define later. Um, there's a result by um, maybe Salomon and Bizocchi. And this is very recent. This is 2019. So uh, you have the same thing. So you have an annulus. So uh, let me make the point that the convexity range is, in principle, non perturbative range of parameters. Right? So this is non perturbative. And well, how about the case where you have a two disk? In this case, 
case B. Where mu is very close to zero, this was done by McGee. And the convexity range again. This was done by Alvers, Fries, Fraunfelder, and Van Kurt, and uh, Hofer. Alvers, Fisch, Fraunfelder. Um, so this is non perturbative, and this is perturbative. Okay. So all of the re non perturbative results that I just mentioned rely on fundamental work by Hofer Visoki Center. Uh, using the curve theory. Okay. So this is what is the free manifold? What the free manifold? So uh, it's a Moser regularization of the level sets. So uh, RP three. It's RP three. <coughs> so how? But. This regularization is near Earth or near Moon, right? Yes. So it's along the boundary components of the hill bridge. There's also a similar story. Uh, there's also work done where you're above the. Uh, I mean, there's, a, there's just a lot of work which I'm actually not mentioning. So this is, I mean, the story is very sort of biased anyway. Uh, so there's also versions for where you do the connected sum um, and the planar problem as well. Also due to Humberto Renevis and Pedro Salomão and people like that. Um, what does it mean, sorry, what does it mean physically for the pair uh, mu C to be in the convexity range? So what it means, well, I'm not sure physically, but sort of mathematically it just means that the regularization of the level set is convex in the fibers. So you have RP3, say in the planar problem, you have RP3 lying in the, Potential bundle of S2 as, as a unit potential bundle, but this unit potential bundle is not round, right? So, what I'm saying is that um, its, it's boundary is convex. It's, okay. okay, thanks. Um, but it's usually, maybe, maybe it's actually a bit stronger than that. What you need to do is you need to take what's called the Levitrita regularization, which sort of gives you um, the double cover of the dynamics on RP3. So now you have an S3 inside R4. So the statement that you're in the convexity range just means that um, this three sphere is strictly convex in R4. So it's a double cover of the Moser regularization, which is the Chiuta regularization, which I might or might not uh, discuss at some point. So let me just write down what I said. Uh, so the all, all non perturbative results. Rely on holomorphic curves. And this is work of the whole of the Soviet Center. And uh, well, I will want to discuss the main ideas from this work maybe in the next lecture. So 
we've got 25 more minutes. So let me let me do some historical digression, which I also find interesting. Um, So this we've already mentioned that the geodesic flow on a sphere appears as a limit case on the three body problem. Um, so I think you can probably trace historically that, you know, this is one of the reasons why Poincaré was also interested in finding geodesics later. Um, and the search, the search of geodesics was in principle a, a, an easier problem than the search of closed orbits in the three body problem, but it's still quite a very complicated problem, um, even on a sphere. Um, I mean, the game here is if you change your metric, then, uh, well, you're trying to find geodesics for, for the changed metric and, you know, good luck trying to find them. And this story actually took a large, large portion of the, of the last century in, in some sense. Also this basic ideas, at least what some of the results by Burkhoff and so on. Um, so, Let me just mention on the search of geodesics. This is also a very, very long story, which I'm just barely touch upon. Um, in some sense, it's a simpler problem than the three body problem. And well, you can uh, consider, first of all, the variational approach. What's the variational approach as well? Uh, you view geodesics as the critical points of a certain length functional on the loop space. And this is nothing else than, well, than the motivation for Morse theory. So Morse theory. On the loop space. Um, so geodesics are just the critical points of the length function. So you write down a functional on the loop space, on the space of loops on your manifolds. You look at the critical points, it's a precise your geodesics, and then, well, um, trying to find those critical points is precisely uh, well, why uh, Morse developed this theory. This is the main motivation for the development of Morse theory comes from the search of geodesics, and that sort of can be traced in some sense to the three body problem as well. Um, And well, you can very well argue that once you've traced Morse theory to the three-body problem, you can trace all of symplectic topology to the three-body problem. <laughs> like, because you can trace Fleur theory to the, to the uh, to Morse theory. <laughs> so I mean, this sort of, like the topology comes here. I mean, why? Because well, we have a slur theory. Let's say in the closed case, as originally considered by Fleur on the closed manifold. So what you want to do is you want to find Hamiltonian orbits. These are the critical points of an action function. And it was basically in this setting that uh, Arnold sort of proposes conjecture, the Arnold conjecture. Conjecture says something about sort of uh, 
fixed points, or in some sense, one periodic orbits of a, of a Hamiltonian. And when Arnold proposed his conjecture, and there are also several versions of it, um, one of the versions was proved by Fleur. Um, when Arnold proposed it, he proposed it as a generalization of the Poincare breakout theorem. So, um, so this is as a version of the Poincare breakout theorem. And if you're away from the closed case, say you have a manifold which has boundary, well, you can also, well, this sort of was souped up uh, to uh, the Fleur theory of, uh, well, manifolds with convex boundary, which is usually called symplectic homology. Which is due to be terrible. Just turned 60. Um, so, symplectic homology is a well a specialized version of Fleur homology, which is for symplectic manifolds. Symplectic homology is for manifolds with convex boundary. So this is convex boundary. And in some sense, symplectic homology is uh, trying to keep track of both dynamical and topological information. Um, so this is related to the very famous Weinstein conjecture, of course, trying to find orbits at the boundary of what's called the Liouville domain. So, right now, these are all just words. I hope to make them precise in some way. But like, at least this is how I like to think about sort of the, the, the one of the major developments of the last century as being just coming from this very concrete problem, the three-body problem. Here we've got the Weinstein conjecture. Which is an open problem in high dimensions. So open in dimension three and then proved by Taubes in dimension three, um, you know, building on the work of uh, many people. So the Weinstein conjecture is also a statement about trying to find orbits of some special cases of dynamical systems, namely, namely rave flux, um, which are uh, um, you know, which is a very large class of flows containing the geodesic flows as well. So this is for great flows. And this uh, contains the class of geodesic flows. And also one of the sort of major projections uh, in this direction have already, uh, you know, appeared and proven is the Conley direction. Which also says some some things about periodic points of Hamiltonians, and this uh, this was proved by Ginsburg. This is for periodic orbits. Hamiltonians. So. Of course, I mean, this is a very biased sort of survey of some of the big results that have appeared in the last century, but biased towards what we have been doing in symplectic geometry for the last 30 or so years. Um, basically how I think, you know, logically the developments have followed in some sense. Um, And in this sort of uh, in this uh, framework, let me mention uh, an important form by Franks, sort of building on the set of ideas for geodesics. So let me just mention one one theorem uh, along these lines. Um, what happens if you're trying to find a uh, uh, on S2? 
you know, remember that the SM flow on S2 appears as a limit case on the three value problem for the round metric. But um, now I just pick any metric, not necessarily the round one. Uh, the round one is the integrable case. Nearby metrics are the near integrable metrics, and then any other metric is non perturbative. So, this is also a, a problem which you can see all of this philosophy that we discussed. So, what happens uh, geodesics on S2? Well, you take S2 with some metric with a positive, uh, positive cur curvature. And what Burkhoff did well, there exists some annulus, which is a global surface of section. Of the geodesic flow. And then, well, by Frank's theorem, so, well, we have infinite many geodesics. On, on S2G. This is sort of one of the big theorems. This was proved in 1992, precisely in the same paper where Frank's proof, proves the, the Frank's theorem. Um, uh, as an application of uh, as a whole sort of set of ideas. In that sense. Um, so you see, I mean, it took a long time since Poincaré uh, started working on this uh, and sort of even on simpler cases like the geodesic flow on it to find geodesics. And this is, of course, motivated by the C minus infinity limit in the three body problem. Let me let me draw a picture of what the Burke of annulus is, because you might have seen this picture at some point. Um, the Burke of annulus. S2 is usually, I mean, you should think of take the sphere so here's S2, and here's S1 as the equator inside S2, and look at all the vectors that point upwards. So this is a, um, this is an annulus, right? Because I have a, the S1, and then I have an, an interval, an open interval worth of uh, vectors pointing up. So the zero section is precisely when my vector uh, points upwards. And this is, uh, this is an annulus. Right? And in the case where your metric is round, if you start shooting orbits, then, well, because round geodesics are just uh, great circles, they will come back to the same point. So the return map is the identity. But if I change my metric, well, the shooting map will change and then you will have a return map. So this is a basic idea. So uh, this is a, sort of the geometric picture for the Burke of annulus and how you would find uh, an annulus uh, global surface of section for the, for the geodesic flow on S2. That gadget every time you have a, you have an annulus every time you have a geodesic. A geodesic. Yeah, uh, and then it depends if it is a surface or section or not, exactly. then you have to see. And those of the surface section comes from positivity of curvature. Some sense. Like, uh, I mean, you have to prove that geodesics don't get trapped, right? Or they will come back precisely because there's curvature. So in the last 10 minutes, let me just mention, a, a, you know, the funny story of a, of Poincaré and how we found chaos and whatnot. Uh, so let me let me trace back. The story of uh, 
the people in dynamical systems like a lot. Which is the story of the Poincaré homoclinic angle. So let's consider a sort of a dynamical system as follows. So imagine, uh, if you remember from your from your uh, classical mechanics lectures, if you ever had one, uh, you should remember the pendulum, which is. Uh, an ample system with whose phase space looks something like this. So you've got an elliptic critical point here, and you've got two hyperbolic points, and, and sort of the stable manifold looks like this for this one. And well, it, actually, it happens that the unstable manifold uh, of this critical point hits uh, corresponds precisely to the stable manifold of the other critical critical point on the other side. This is hyperbolic H1, H2, and this is some elliptic. So this is what space space looks like in low energy. And then once you cross uh, high energy, you know, the, the phase space uh, is foliated by level sets which look like this. So this is the energy, uh, um, this is the, the, the phase space is the diagram for the pendulum. Uh, but what happens in, in the particular case of the pendulum? H1 and H2. So what, what was the question? Because I, I imagine E is when the, pen, when the pendulum is down, yeah. and doesn't move. Um, I was expecting okay. one H when the pendulum is up okay, and doesn't move. Fine. So H1 and H2 are the same in the case of the pendulum. Okay. So, you need to, so you need to identify this with this. Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you could, you know, you could have a dynamic system which looks like this, for uh, H1 and H2, different or the same if you want. Okay. Um, but what happens with the case of the pendulum? Because well, it's an integrable system, so you can write down everything. You can understand precisely what's going on. Um, and in this particular case, it happens that you know you have this fortunate situation in which uh, this goes precisely to here. As in other words, like the stable and unstable foliations coincide. Okay. But usually what you would expect is when you perturb such a system, this picture is no longer there, and you would get some picture which looks like this. So now, where the unstable foliation of this guy does not really coincide with the uh, stable foliation, uh, so the stable one of this guy does not coincide with the unstable one of this one. Right, so this is this is the sort of the perturbed picture, if you want. Um, and once you have an intersection like this. Um, what happens is that the dynamical system starts behaving in a really crazy way, um, in a chaotic way, in fact, uh, because you need to remember that the stable and unstable foliation are both invariant under the flow. So if I have an intersection here, because this manifold is invariant, well, it happens that the, the iterator, the, the, the image of this point under the map will have to lie on the same uh, it's a manifold, but the same is true for this other one. So it's an intersection point of the two. So they have to intersect. And then I can argue the same thing for this one, and they have to intersect again, and again, and again. And then at some point, they will come close to this region here. But the dynamical system is expanding in this direction. So what happens is that this thing gets bigger and bigger until it intersects the other the manifold again, and you can play the same game, and what you end up having is some crazy pattern, which is called the Poincaré homoclinic uh, angle. So this is a so 
<laughs> it's a very crazy pattern. If you know, we start drawing all, all the things, this repeats itself over and over again. So you have some very hard to draw uh, object. Um, and this, you know, comes to Poincaré's famous mistake on the three body problem on which, you know, the story goes like this roughly. I mean, the King of Sweden uh, was having his 60th birthday because, you know, people turning 60 is important apparently. <laughs> and so he, he had this prize going on, you know, because people wanted to understand the stability of the solar system, you know, whether or not the motion of the planets is stable or, you know, the moon is gonna crash against the earth at some point. I mean, it's, okay, it's a, fair enough. It's an interesting uh, problem we should know the answer to. Um, but uh, of course, the general case is very difficult. So when Kere sort of submitted his, uh, his article on the three body problem, on which he argued that he could show stability. Um, and well, as we know nowadays, it turns out that, uh, that there was a mistake in his original uh, article. I mean, the funny thing about the story, this article was submitted to none other than Mittag Leffler here at the, at the Institute. Um, so Mittag Leffler at the time, you know, was this sort of important figure in the mathematics in Sweden. Um, he was responsible, you know, for, for example, you know, uh, helping people like Sofia Kolikskaya uh, to get a professorship at the time when women, you know, could not be professors, um, amongst several other things. Also, sort of funding the Acta Mathematica journal that we have here um, available for us. Um, uh, and the the reason why we know the story is because uh, some historian, I think, called Barrow Green in the 90s, uh, found the original article. So Poincaré's mistake was precisely to think that when you perturbed a picture like this, which you find in the interval case, you will find a perturbed situation in which this is the situation also looks like this. So if you imagine that this sits in your surface of section, what this translates to when you move this around, it means that there's an, like a, traces out a torus, right? Which is this circle times this one that separates phase space in, the, in dimension three. So you can't cross that torus. This means stability in some sense. Remember, hill stability means uh, spaces separated on regions which you cannot cross. So if you have this picture, you have stability. And so for Kare saw that if I perturb this and I also have stability, it turns out that this is the actual picture. So the submanifold section intersect transversely rather than being than coinciding. So he realized later, after you know he found his mistake and took all the papers back. Uh, spending more money than the price money of, of you know, Sweden. Um, but he, he found this pattern and, and, and basically that's where the modern theory of dynamical systems and chaos theory sort of can be traced to in some sense. Um, um, and yeah, I mean, later in the 60s and so on, people like Smale, I mean, realized that, you know, in, inside this picture, you can find uh, what's called a, the horseshoe, the Smell horseshoe, which is, is a model for chaotic dynamics in which you can find all sorts of orbits and so on. Um, and also related to the notion of symbolic dynamics. So inside this kind of very complicated dynamical system, you find the horseshoe and the horseshoe, uh, you can study it in terms of what's, uh, of what's called a Bernoulli shift. So it's some sort of formal dynamical system associated to it, which it's some sense equivalent to the original problem. So in studying the Bernoulli shift, you know that you will find all sorts of periodic orbits in this uh, situation with arbitrary long periods and sort of topological entropy is positive and you know, all sorts of crazy stuff happens. Uh, so you know, when people say that Poincaré found chaos, this is what they mean. So, so uh, I'll finish. Uh, so I'll finish for today and I'll take it back next time. So, so thanks for joining and thanks for any questions? Any complaints or comments? <laughs> okay, so thanks everyone again. Um, so I'll see everyone next Wednesday at the same time. Next Wednesday, this Wednesday. Sorry, this Wednesday. <laughs> so next next session, next Wednesday. I'm a bit tired. <laughs>